I have a new computer. This is a Casio FX850P pocket computer. It's from 1987. It's a very early ultra portable, I suppose you'd say. It's got 8K of RAM, an 8-bit processor, and it runs basic. It even works. Although actually getting the screen on camera is surprisingly hard. I've been looking for one of these for a while. I remember these from my childhood as interesting and weird and surprisingly useful. The screen here, which I'll show later, has got two lines of text on it and you can actually write some pretty decent programs. It's got a huge library of mathematical functions, all as ghostable routines from your basic program. It also operates as a pretty decent standalone calculator and even has a little word processor on it. You may notice I'm touching this rather gingerly. That's because this thing is absolutely disgustingly filthy. So I am going to have to take it apart to clean it and then go and wash my hands. Like, it really, it's got caked on sweaty dirt everywhere. But that will also give me a good opportunity to take the lid off. And once that's done and I'm capable of like using the keyboard without wincing, I will attempt to demonstrate how it works and why I'm interested in it. Okay, the first thing is to open it up. Now, it is missing its vital screws, so it is in fact taped together. And now I notice it's actually also a little bit bent, which isn't so great. So, hopefully that will do it. I should have some screws of about the right size, which I can replace it with. We go. Blech. There we go. And the back comes off reasonably neatly. And yes, it is bent and it's also covered in gunk and now tape adhesive. So this is going to get a scrub down and washed with IPA or WD-40 or something to take the gunk off. I guess the last bit of paint. Inside we have the back chassis revealing the memory upgrade port here. A expandable memory card screws on these three uh, screw points and presses down onto these terminals. This is one of the things I'm interested in. I want to uh, explore the bus. There's very little known about this CPU and I'm hoping that I can build something that will snoop the bus and uh, hopefully reveal the uh, contents of the ROM. The CPU is known to be a Harvard architecture device so ROM and RAM occupy different address spaces. Uh, in some ways that's good because it means you get like 64K of available RAM plus 64K probably of ROM space. In others it's difficult because you can't easily upload code onto it. So it runs off two standard button cells and this is the backup battery for the RAM. So that has now factory reset the device. There was one very large text file on it that compared to contain gibberish, so no great loss there. Uh, I want to take the front panel off so that I can take the keys off because they're horrible too. You might be able to see the brown gunge everywhere. I believe I need to take the 
To do that, I need to take the back chassis off. Let's find a better screwdriver. Okay. That's the... That does fit. Just... There's a expansion port on the side, which is here, which is in fact the only port on the machine, which is a combined parallel interface, serial interface, uh, and power input. There's a plug-on interface module that will allow you to use a cassette recorder to load and save programs, and... Uh, print to a real printer uh, and power it from the mains, etc. These things are like hen's teeth. I found one on eBay for a hundred plus pounds, so I don't think I'll be getting one of them. Uh, it's, it's all standard 5 volt TTL, so it should be easy enough to bodge something up. Being a 5 volt device, I'm hoping that it should be fairly straightforward to use a DIY signal analyzer to talk to the bus. I will show you the actual works once this comes off. That's a lot of screws. this one. All right, and that removes the this panel, Oops. which exposes the works. So what we've got here are probably two RAM chips. They are different. This is for a additional internal RAM expansion. They produced a couple of models of this with different amounts of RAM. And I found uh, homebrew instructions for taking a perfectly standard surface mount uh, SRAM chip and soldering it on there. Uh, that means that you don't need the expansion port anymore. Uh, which, if I'm going to be doing horrible things with it, is probably a good thing. Um, I will actually... Let's have a quick look with this. This is... this connector is... standard tenth of an inch pitch. So these... Yeah, that doesn't fit at all which means this is not tenth of an inch pitch, so I will probably need something bodged to connect to that. Here is the expansion port. Uh, these are all test pads. There might be something of interest there. But the bulk of the work are in these three chips. This one is a uh, HD6002, and it is the CPU, and this is the thing that nobody really knows anything about. It's probably an 8-bit CPU. Uh, it runs at 1.228 megahertz. Guess how I know. But other than that, it's a bit of a mystery. These are LCD controllers, and they each operate half of the LCD screen. And here is the connector onto that. And you can see the wires spreading out from each controller to the relevant halves of the uh, display. Okay, so I think that was the last screw. So with luck...
This should just lift. Uh, something here. Ah, oh, there is a screw. Uh, this is the Pizza Electric Squeaker. Yes, it's got sound. Very, very thin wires. I'm actually quite lucky there we go, not to break it when I lifted the back off. And this reveals the keyboard, which is a not very well fastened in membrane. Oh yes, the this piece this all fits down like this, that's better. And when you press a key, it pushes a carbon pad onto one of these tracks. And the on off switch is this. which uh, connects these pads here together. I notice that the camera is having a lot of difficulty with light. Uh, let's move this slot out of the way. Let's remove the that's a bit better. Now you can see slightly. That's the curse of auto exposure, I'm afraid. So this is all going to need cleaning. Uh, the I'll just wipe these over with contact cleaner. But let's remove the keyboard membranes. And the screen, which has to unscrew here. Now I've got to be really careful with the screen. The way that these connectors, uh, or the way that these ribbon cables connect to LCD screens like this is very dubious. And I don't really want to make it come astray. Okay, so this can all push aside because I'm not interested in that anymore. And we lift up the membrane and the rubber mats. And they are also pretty grim. And this mysterious copper sheet goes aside. And then this reveals screws which are used for tensioning and electrical connection between the cases, between the case halves, which I shall take out. Uh, he said take out. And that reveals, firstly is the window, which if I reflect the light off it, you can see is also pretty grim. Uh, there is a way to polish these up using Brasso, but I haven't tried that. I don't think I've got anything appropriate. And the next thing is to take the keys out. And 
wash everything. So the keys are actually quite uninteresting. They're just simple chunks of plastic. The tricky bit is the order. Luckily, I have photographs of how this is supposed to look. So I can go ahead and just turn the thing over. I hope. And that's the switch popped out. Right, and these are all the bits I need to clean. So let me go and get some warm water and then I think it's time for a cleaning montage. Yuck. Then I get to put it back together again and hope it works. Hot soap and water, sponge, paper towel, elderly toothbrush, we are ready to go. Right, now it is all dry, or at least dry enough, so I get to put the keys back again, and that will be exciting. Luckily I've got this key. And unfortunately, because the keys will just fall out, if I put a key in at random, it doesn't go in. This way up. That's a letter key, so that'll probably go there. There we go. If I... Yep. So turning it over is going to be interesting. So I have this piece of foam, which should hopefully keep the keys in. Anyway, we will see.
Okay. Now let us start putting this all back together then. Uh, first thing is the screen. The screen did not clean up at all well. It's just horribly, horribly scratched. Uh, it really needs replacing completely. I will try and get some Brasso and give it a go and see what happens, but I don't hold out too much hope. Now I'm not sure which way up it goes. That'll do. Let's get the fingerprints off the inside. And of course... A stray printer filament, remove that. I managed to flip some keys, so we have to put these all back again. I think that's still more or less correct. Okay, so now these go on. Two membranes, one goes there, and one goes here. Ah. Now goes on the carbon mat, followed by the ah, uh, not followed by the whole mat. So the way it works is you push a key that pushes the carbon pad up through one of these holes. This spacer piece keeps the carbon pads away from the PCB. The carbon pad then touches the PCB. However, we are not going to be able to put this on right now because this opaque piece is supposed to go behind the screen. So now we have to reattach the screen. So this screws down here. That does not look like it works because the... Oh, I've done this in the wrong order, that's why. Yes, this screws down here, and then the other mats go on top of it. Okay, so we screw the screen on. Uh, with the right screws. I think it was these small screws. There are only two of them, and there's two screw holes. There isn't a hole behind that part of the screen. No, that's, that's just wrong. So, 
we've got the one small screw for the PCB. So this actually goes here. Just take a brief moment to wipe it. Ah, there we go. All right. Just wasn't in properly. mat goes on and it's got these cutouts here for the screw piece so now this goes on then this goes on yeah, I have forgotten this extra copper piece, which looking at the position of the screws goes on under the screen. Fantastic. So this is copper coated mylar, I think. So that goes into place here. Now does this, yes, this doesn't have cutouts for the screen, therefore, uh, it goes above the screws. In fact, I think if I can get this off again, that this goes on under the screen screws. All right, so let's now do these up again. So what this probably is, is a conductive sheet that grounds one side of the keyboard. Okay, so this piece goes on. Um, could be wrong. So these, it's, the layout does seem a bit weird. 
I am going to have to go and check the uh, footage. But I would expect the copper piece to be on top of the on top of this to provide extra holes to move the carbon pads through. So this would then go on here. And then the PCB would go on. I will go and check the footage and come back. Now this is actually correct. It's a bit odd, but there you go. So before I do anything else, I'm going to clean these contacts. I've got some contact cleaner. Just go over them. Especially the on off switch, which is looking kind of grim. Wow, strong smell of solvent. If I start behaving more oddly than usual, let me know. Okay, so now... Oh yes, uh, just give it a moment to let the solvent dry a bit more, but while I'm at it, you notice this key is different. That corresponds to this one. So what these keys do is they press the carbon pad against one of these p these contacts and that makes an electrical circuit. This one is different. This one shorts together these two sets of filaments. Uh, that is because that key is break, which is an interrupt key. So all the rest of the keys will be scanned by the processor using a standard row column probe thing. The keys are divided into a, a matrix, an XY grid, and it'll energize one entire column of keys and then sense each one to see if contacts made. And it will scan one column at a time or one row at a time. This key is different as this will is probably connected to an interrupt line so that even if the machine is busy and you press break and it's not scanning the keyboard, it will get the CPU's attention and something will happen. Okay, so now I want the small screw. which goes on here. Now, when it comes to... Uh, actually, while I'm here again, let's just... Just do those. Don't think there's anything else that needs cleaning. So, in order to snoop the bus, I think I will need access to these terminals and possibly some of these. Uh, it does say under here somewhere on the PCB what the various uh, p pads do. And these chips are well understood so you can identify what the various pads do from the data sheet. The actual ROM containing the code is built into the CPU so it's completely inaccessible. What I'm hoping to do is, assuming the CPU, when it's doing a ROM access, still has the address and data lines hooked up, which seems pretty plausible for a simple processor, then 
I should be able to watch the chip select lines and the data lines and the address lines. There we go. Don't want that. But I do want to clean the gunk off again. So more contact cleaner. So what we've got here is clock voltage uh, AD address data multiplexed. But we also have uh, IO one, two, three, five, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. Address lines zero to seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, just twelve, and multiple chip select lines. That seems doable. These pads are big enough to solder on too, if necessary. I'd rather find a connector, but I don't think I will. I'm not going to do that now. Uh, it's also worth exploring these test pads to see if they're hooked up to anything useful. I don't know what SPI says. It probably does not mean standard peripheral interface like they do for other for in more modern systems. Okay, anyway, now these springs go in there and there. This little spring did that go under the board? I thought it went there. I think it goes under the board. It's the wrong screwdriver. So it'll very soon be moment of truth time when I find out whether this thing still works. Okay, so now the chassis goes back on. Is these two springs poking through? I think I may have put these on upside down. Yes, that's better. 
Now all the screws do up again. Start with the one in the middle. So you see this is now exposed. Uh, lots of useful test pads. It would help if I had a wide logic analyzer so I could hook it up to all these pads simultaneously and get a trace. However, my only logic analyzer is a 8-bit wide one, so that's not very helpful. It would be instructive to connect it to the, uh, the address lines. If I see the address counting up in small increments of one or two bytes, that will be fetching opcodes from the ROM, and I can probably rely on the uh, the data lines showing me the byte being read from ROM. The other thing I need to hook up to is the chip select lines, because with luck, when reading from the ROM, it will not be asserting any of the chip select lines because the chip select lines will be trying will be there to access RAM. That way I'll be able to easily distinguish between ROM and RAM. If I can decode the ROM, then ideally this would then lead to reverse engineering the instruction set. That's getting pretty hard. But uh, one possibility, or one possibility is to try and find an area of ROM that's unpopulated and then force the machine to jump to uh, a location there. I could potentially, using a microcontroller connected to this interface, then simulate ROM and run my own machine code on it. I mean, this is not useful in any sense of the word, but it would be cool. Okay, we're now powered on, by the way. Okay, um, and I'll just put this back on to just cover up those two slightly delicate springs. Oh, and we have something on the screen. Let me just uh, interesting. It's not responding to anything in the keyboard. It's printed some gibberish. It's not even responding to the on-off switch. There's a reset button here. Right, that's turned itself off. And we have a flashing cursor, and it's responding to key presses. And now it's clean, so I don't feel dirty for pressing keys. Hopefully they're all in the right place. Looks like it. Yep. Hmm. It's frozen again.
That's very interesting. When I press the XE, XE key to actually execute something, it crashes. Well, I'm going to try putting it into basic. That's crashed again. Something's not right. Probably a short somewhere. So mode one for basic. All right, that has gone into basic and it says there's 12K free. Seems odd given that this is probably an 8K device. Well, I'm going to try and uh, new all for wiping all memory. PR error. Not printed on the help card. Okay, going to have to look up what that. Oh, here we go. PR, PR, PR error, protected error. Interesting. Um, I think when I took the backup battery out, memory got corrupted, and I need to do a full reset somehow. Let's try all reset. Back into calculator mode. Yeah, okay. It's working. Good. Right, I'll take a break and look up some programs and also go and try and find... Uh, some screws to hold the back on, see if I can got anything in the junk drawers that will fit. And then I'll come back and make it a bit more visible on camera and try and demonstrate why this is such a cool device. So here we are. I will now demonstrate the machine. Now it's clean enough, I can bear to touch it. So there is one problem, which is that these LCD screens are, uh, they have a notoriously narrow angle of view, which means that either the camera can see it, which is up here, or I can see it, which I am over here, but not really both at once. So I've adjusted it to be visible on the camera. So I'm actually having a bit of trouble seeing what's on the screen, but we'll see what we can do. So this is a pocket computer. It's designed for uh, mobile use. You take it out of your pocket, you do something, you put it back again. It comes on instantly, like genuinely instantly. It's got a surprising battery life of 100 to 150 hours on those two little button cells. Uh, it's a surprisingly nice machine to use. It's got three main modes of operation. The default one, and the one which is in which it is in now, it says Cal up there, is calculator mode, where it will execute, uh, evaluate a expression. And this is just using the standard basic expression parser with a few extensions. And it's surprisingly decent. Uh, you've got, you know, power operators, the usual sine, cosine operators, arc sine, uh, meaningless error messages that you have to look up here. So MA error means mathematical error because uh, arc sine of eight doesn't make any sense. You get variables. Uh, I'll just stick the thing into lowercase to make it a bit easier to read. So I can say x equals 5. Now I can say x and it will evaluate it. Uh, x to the power of 2.1, you know, usual things. It's got a bunch of useful mathematical functions, including uh, factorial, which you get at using the fact keyword. Whoops, that's the wrong key. And you can either use the shortcuts, which you probably won't be able to read because the paint's faded, uh, which you get at using shift and one of the keys. So shift up arrow produces fact. 
or I can just type FACT, it's all case insensitive. Ah, done that again. So factorial 5, uh, it's got polar and rectangular coordinate conversion, it's got a few basic permutation and, comp and combination functions, uh, degrees, minutes and seconds conversion using DMS string. So I can say DMS string 1.5 and out will come is a string value which is 1.5 degrees in base 60 notation. Uh, you can do string variables just like in basic. So uh, a string, you can't, oops, you can't ob Obviously, you can't do mathematical operations on them. TM error is type mismatch. Uh, it's got a rather interesting formula evaluation function. So if I enter a formula using any variables and then press in, that will store it into function memory. And I can press out to reproduce that at any moment. So you can use it as a simple clipboard. But if you press the calc button, it will analyze the expression you gave it to find the free variables and then allow you to enter numbers for them. And it will then calculate the result. And you can do uh, x times y colon b equals x divided by y. That is two uh, function, uh, two expressions, functions, uh, one after the other with a colon, put that in. Now if I press calc, it will actually ask me for both. So I can see two, three, and give me both results simultaneously, which is actually quite useful. And that is about it for the calculator mode. The main other feature that you get at from here doesn't really have anything to do with calculator mode, but that's the standard library, which is a huge library of useful routines. This is the list of them, each of which is identified by number. You, there is a browser, so I can press menu and then page through them one at a time, quite slowly but it's much easier to look them up here. So for example, uh, library routine 5050 quadratic equation. I cite 5050 and press lib. And this is the quadratic equation solver. It will prompt me for the three values of A, B, and C. And out comes the two roots. Uh, minus 1 plus, that isn't quite how I expect quadratic, ah, ah, that's a negative, that's a, that's an I, that's a complex root. I gave it a quadratic uh, equation that cannot be trivially solved, but it solved it, which is nice. There's a lot of these. Uh, there's a bunch of mathematical ones, there's a bunch of statistical ones I just don't understand. There are also some routines that just provide cheat sheets. So for example, uh, 5910 scientific constants uh, is just a library of useful scientific constants, which you can page through and find. I recognize some of them. That's That one's the speed of light. Uh, I can't quite read that. Oh, charge of the electron. Uh, Earth's gravitational acceleration. Average. Um, fine number constant. Yeah, let's move on. It's been a long time since I've done any of these. Um, all these library routines are written in BASIC. You can write a program on this machine that will pull them out of ROM and print them, which will then allow you to type them in again and modify them. They are 
pretty spaghetti code, I have to say. And that brings me to the second main mode, which is programming mode. And to get at that, I do mode one. And that takes me into basic programming mode. There are 10 program slots you can use, and you can switch between these at any point. And each one of these is, a, is its own basic interpreter. So I can type in a basic statement, and it'll execute it immediately, or I can put it in a program and run it. And if I go back to the program mode menu, star here indicates there is a program in this slot. This is how much memory is free. I don't have any of the uh, memory expansion packs on. But I can go to uh, program slot one is empty. Program slot zero has something in it. It's a fairly basic, basic. If you're used to Microsoft Basic, there will be no surprises here. It's uh, got numbered lines. Uh, subroutines are called with GoSub. It's got arbitrary length uh, variables. Uh, it's got string variables. It's got multidimensional arrays. Uh, that's about it. There's nothing particularly exciting. There's a lot of undocumented features which are quite useful. So I can say print peak zero and that will read the byte at memory location zero in the data RAM, not the code ROM. Harvard architecture machine, remember? Uh, because the ROM is bigger than 64K, you can only access 64K at a time, but there's actually a neat thing called defseg that allows you to change the base address of what you're reading. So that will now produce a different number because I'm referring to a different part of the ROM. Uh, the ROM is largely been reverse engineered. It mostly contains the library functions. The interesting bit, which is the basic interpreter, is in the code ROM which is currently inaccessible. Um, what else has this got that's interesting? It's The screen is actually eight lines high and you can steer the cursor around just like you can on the Commodore 64. You can list the program and then go up to the listing and let's put some punctuation in like so, and when you press XC, it will read the line off the screen and re-execute it. So that has now entered that. If I do list here, it won't work because I was actually overwriting the ready prompt. So there you see it's actually updated our program, um, which is quite nice. There is an actually an editor using the edit keyword but uh, I've tried it a bit and it doesn't seem to be much. So let's write a little game, very, very simple game. So let's go for new to clear this program slot. And this is just going to be a guess a number game. So number equals, uh, we want to going to use the ran function to actually produce a random number, multiply it by 100 and then take the integer value of that. That will produce a integer random number from 0 to 99. Uh, count equals 1 because our, we're on our first guess. 30 is going to be where we're starting. We're actually going to prompt the user for a guess. So it 
in real life you wouldn't actually use long function uh, long variable names because they use up a ton of RAM and this thing only has like three and a half K of available RAM anyway so if guess is less than number then print too low uh, for line 50 this is going to be very similar so we're just going to steal we're just going to copy line 40 and you see that it's tokenized the uh, the code that I gave it and has capitalized the keywords, which is nice. Uh, you don't have to supply spaces between keywords, uh, unlike a lot of other basics. If you omit the space between if and guess, it will still treat if as a keyword. Uh, so, uh, where are we? We're at line 70. Yeah, okay, 70. If guess is not number, then go to 30. So when we reach line 80, we have actually finished. So, yeah. Annoying feature. The shift key is a toggle. You can see the indicator there going on and off. And you can't press two keys at once. So, And also it doesn't capitalize letters. You have to use caps to do that, which is also a toggle. So I prefer typing in lowercase. So in order to get the capital G here, or the capital Y here, I have to do caps, Y, caps. So you got it in count goes. Right, that should actually work. Guess a number, 50, too low. Uh, it tried to scroll the screen. It has paused with the stop indicator on for me to press XE to continue. So 75. Too high. 60. Too high. 55. Too low. 58. Too high. It must be 57. You got it in one goes. Mm, that's not right. Uh, that's because I forgot to increment the guess counter, which happens here. Uh, count equals count plus one, go to 30. Uh, uh, there's a clear screen somewhere. Here we go, shift BS. All right, run. Guess a number, 50. Uh, that's happened before. I think that's because I started typing when it was in the stopped mode. I don't actually know where the, the text entry goes there, which is odd. So 50 was too low, let's go for 75, too high, 60, too low, 65, too low. Too high, too high. Really? I thought I'd tried 75. 65? There we go. You got it in 13 goes. Well, there we have our program. Uh, if I go back to mode one, we still have. Uh, 3,300 bytes left, 
bytes seem to go a long way on this, which is quite nice. Uh, yes, there is a third mode, and that is the memo, which is here under memo. This is a single text file that you can keep in memory. So if I go to mode 9, memo in, I can do, you know, random text. Uh, more random text. Up here, there's a little display that tells you which field you're on. Uh, oddly, it only updates after you start entering something. But anyway, we now have three lines of text in the memo pad. You can see the field number changing. You can browse it and edit it by using the memo key, although the interaction between memo and mode memo in is a bit strange. Right, so now I've entered some text. If I go to program one and I say read a string and data like that. Now this is a basic feature where you can embed data into your program. Uh, there's a data pointer which starts at the beginning of the program. Whenever you do a read statement, it will advance to the next data statement and read the value attached to it uh, in a copper comma separated value way. So I actually forgot a line here. So we do print a string. This is relevant, trust me. Like so. So if we run that, it has read the one line of data that's embedded into the program. Now, where this relates to the memo pad is if I, instead of read, I do read hash. And I arrays line 20. So now we just have read and print. That has actually read the first record from the memo pad. If I do 20, go to 10, so it turns into a loop. So this is now reading one record at a time from the memo pad. And you notice a DA error means out of data. It's here. And if I press, uh, if I go to mode in and press memo, you can see that uh, it has read text as one record, more random text as another record, and each of one comma two comma three become three more records. So a uh, new line or comma separated values. So this allows you to write a program that operates on data in a file put that data into the memo pad and it will iterate through. Uh, this is surprisingly useful. The, uh, the basic decompiler, which will run on this, actually operates by having a memo pad table of where all the, uh, the routines are in the ROM. Um, it's certainly easier to enter stuff into the memo pad than it is to put it into data statements. Now, uh, there are more features. I mentioned peek and poke. I can load and save, so I can just save the program to cassette. And this is now actually doing it, but I don't have a cassette attached, so it's not gonna do anything. It's just going to push it out to the peripheral port and will eventually, there we go, finish. Uh, you can also save the memo pad and you can save all data, but it's all 10 program segments plus the memo pad. Uh, you can open and close files on tape to do uh, sequential access. Uh, it supports two different cassette devices, so you can have one for input and one for output. Don't have any of that hardware. 
apparently it's quite easy to emulate with a microcontroller, so that might be worth a try. It's got a RS-232 port. I think it's actually a TTL RS-232 port, but there you go. And you can open streams and read and write from that. Uh, you could use this thing as a simple serial terminal if you wanted to. It's got a printer and you can either use, you can open an output stream or you can use the L print statement. I don't know what that'll do. Uh, it's hanging because it's waiting for an acknowledgement for the printer that's not attached. Um, so despite being so small, this is actually a pretty capable and fully fledged computer. It is not the quickest. I have yet to find any time functions, which is unfortunate, so I can't run a benchmark. Uh, I'm used to... I wasn't expecting that to do anything. Okay, uninitialized variables apparently become uh, default to zero, which is surprising. Um, there's a bunch of other things which you can see on the, on the screen. There's a couple of letters of Japanese on the left. We've got defm, prut, and tr. Prut is probably for printer output. You can actually, oh, I can do mode seven. Yes, that's lit up. So now everything that comes out will go to the printer or not because I don't have a printer. Right, and it's now hung waiting for the printer to respond because it's filled up the printer buffer. So let's turn that off, shall we? That's mode eight. Yep. Uh, I don't know what defm is. tr is uh, trace. So if I go back to program zero, which has got our game in it, I can do tron, trace on, and now every time it hits a line, it will log the line number. This is the only debugging feature. Uh, let's turn that off again. Uh, there is more stuff tucked away. Oh yeah, you can define, it doesn't do graphics, but you but the character set is user-definable. Well, some of the character set is user-definable, so you can create your own graphics characters. Um, there is actually a, there is an undocumented library function, which doesn't appear in the chart. Shall we go back to calculator mode? It is 0400 lib, and this is the self-test routine. So that has just detected 8K of onboard RAM, no uh, add-on RAM. It's done a simple memory test. It's detected uh, one megabyte of ROM. These are selected bytes from the ROM, probably some sort of ROM ID. A screen test, all pixels on, all pixels off, uh, only odd pixels only even pixels. This uses user-defined characters. Uh, and now it dumps everything to the printer. That's not going to work. So break out of that. Uh, there are some others, uh, including a undocumented routine that will uh, import basic programs from a different version of the calculator, if you happen to have one of them. So that's the FX850, one of the more seminal uh, pocket computers that ran BASIC. There were others. Casio made a whole range of these. The early BASIC pocket computers actually ran off two 4-bit processors uh, using video RAM to store the program you were running, which is extremely weird but making effective use of the bespoke hardware they had. Uh, later ones converged on the Z80 along with the Texas Instrument line. Uh, there was a, 
a line of TRS-80 branded pocket computers that were Z80 based and ran basic. Very, very similar to this, but different. They gradually fell out of fashion as graphic calculators got more sophisticated. And I actually have somewhere a Voyage 200. Here it is, my Voyage 200 late era graphic calculator uh, on. Mm, the batteries have gone flat. Uh, this thing has a 68,000 processor, uh, lots of RAM, a monster ROM, a huge library of software, most of which I can't use, and a programming language that isn't really basic. The keyboard is actually slightly better. It's a bit more tactile and the keys are a bit bigger than on this, but uh, it's still not brilliant. Um, but that is very much a graphic calculator and programming is a bit of an afterthought. I really like these devices which are front and center pocket computers. The calculator mode is uh, just an extension to the basic interpreter. The entire library is written in basic. The basic interpreter is the heart of everything that makes it work. And I like that. I like the fact that it's a real computer that you can connect peripherals to and do things with. And, and you can add on to. And the form factor, the fact that it's designed to be pocketable, the fact that it's designed to be programmed is something I feel is rather missing, even though everyone these days has a smartphone with a billion times the power of one of these. The smartphones are consumer-oriented devices. You do what the smartphone tells you you can do. This gives you a basic prompt and some uh, functionality, and, you know, it'll do whatever you tell it to do, which I like. I think I will actually get use out of this. I haven't found myself using either the Voyage or the HP 48, simply because the learning curve is too high and, well, the learning curve is too high. If these both ran basic, I would use them constantly. It's a bit of a shame that the basic dialect is kind of bad, but that's what it was in those days. Anyway. That is my Casio FX850P. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.